Well, good morning. Eh, sound like the turkey is still affecting you a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. It's great to see you this morning. I hope you've had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. How many of you just want to admit right now in church, confess that you ate too much? It's always good to confess in church. It's good for the soul. Um, I want to make a quick announcement before I get into the message today. I had a couple things I want to announce, but this is the main thing. Um, Starting this Wednesday, this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock at the gathering, Sam and I are going to be doing a series that kind of takes a little bit of a different look at Christmas. Uh, This series is actually Sam's idea. We were talking a couple of weeks ago about what direction do we go on Wednesday nights and how do we want to approach Christmas on Wednesday nights that'll be a little different than what we do on Sunday morning. And he started rattling off a bunch of ideas. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, man. I haven't even had time to think about it. I was just saying, I was just asking the question to talk to you about it later. And he rattles off several things and he finally comes to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm like, Ephesians chapter 2? And so he goes through those verses really quick with me and and talks about how he sees them pointing to Christmas. And so we are doing a series on Wednesday night for the next three Wednesday nights called But God. And it's just going to be taking a little bit of a different approach to Christmas than you might expect. And we'll be doing that through the looking at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that series as well. I hope it'll be a great compliment to what we're going to be talking about here on Sunday mornings. This morning and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at Christmas through the lens of the Advent wreath. And if you look in your bulletin this morning as we went through uh, the hanging of the green this morning in each element, uh, Rex kind of organized that in the order of the Advent wreath. And, and I, I, know, I know what the Advent wreath represents and I've, I've read about it and I've studied it. I've probably even taught a little bit on it with youth groups in the past, but it's not one of those things that's really ever stuck with me very well. And here we, we use the Advent wreath in our services every year, and we light the candles every year, and I just had a feeling that maybe I'm not the only one that doesn't really understand what it represents and, and hasn't really, maybe I'm not the only one that hadn't taken the opportunity to see how God can challenge us and teach us and grow us through the Advent wreath and what it represents. This morning... We have, we have lit the very first purple candle, which is the prophecy candle. And that's, prophecy is not so much what we're going to talk about this morning as, as much as what prophecy represents. Why is it that God would prophesy about things to come? Why would he tell us about things that are going to happen in the future and not necessarily tell us exactly when it's going to happen? Why would he do that? Why would he fill the Old Testament with prophecies about Jesus' birth, about his second coming, and about all the things that he would do? Why would God do that? What is the purpose of prophecy? Does anybody know the answer? It's written in your bulletin. Hint, hint. Hope. It gives us hope. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, there are tons and tons of prophecies about Jesus' incarnation, his birth, his coming in the flesh. And Jesus, I, 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 don't, I honestly cannot remember how many prophecies that are estimated that he fulfilled just in being born, but it's a lot. And many of them are in the book of Isaiah, and one that I want to read this morning is in Isaiah chapter 11. And I put in your bulletin that it's going to be, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. We're really only going to read verses 1 through 5 and then verse 10, but I encourage you to go and read this entire passage, um, even though we'll be skipping a few verses. And these verses will kind of be our launching pad to talk about what is the hope of Christmas. Read these verses with me. Follow along in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah writes, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him in the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be the fear, in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the, me- for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with rods of his mouth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. 
Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Then look at verse 10. He basically concludes this, this thought with the very, with, with kind of referring back to verse 1. It says, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now this was written some 400 years before Jesus was ever born. And we know that this is about Jesus. There's, you, know, you might read that and say, oh, well, this is about the stump of Jesse and a shoot shall come up. Maybe he's talking about David. Well, that wouldn't make a lick of sense because David wouldn't have been a shoot off of the stump of Jesse. He would have been off of the tree of Jesse. He would have been right there. But what, what the Lord is telling his people is that I am sending someone greater than David. I am sending someone sometime in the future, and we happen to know it's some 400 years later, but I am sending someone who is going to rescue my people, who is going to redeem my people, who is going to save my people, and we know that that person is Jesus Christ. And God places these prophecies in the Old Testament for one major reason, probably many reasons, but one major reason is to give us hope. Our God is a promise-making God. He is a promise keeping God. And today we need to understand, I want us to try to understand what hope is and what it means to live with hope. A couple of days ago, uh, we were cooking, well, uh, we, I say we were cooking. We weren't cooking. I was observing the cooking being done and looking forward to the eating of the cooking. But I asked uh, my mother-in-law in April, I said, how would you define hope? I just want you to think about that for a second. How would you define hope? If you had to write the definition in the, in the dictionary, how would you define it? We talked and talked and talked about several things, about several aspects, and we actually came up with something pretty close to Webster's Dictionary um, definition of hope. And Webster's Dictionary says this, Hope is to desire with expectation of obtainment or to expect with confidence. And that's basically the conclusion we came to. If I had to just define the word hope, that's basically what we came up with as well, except with more words. And so I asked the question, well, what's the difference in hope and wishful thinking? I don't know what the, dif what the difference would be. Wishful thinking would be to desire with expectation of attainment. Wishful thinking would be to expect with confidence. Wishful thinking would be even to say, to, to look forward to good things happening to you in the future. But hope, I believe, is something very different. And I believe that genuine hope only comes from one place. There is actually only one real hope. There are not multiple definitions. There's not a way to generalize it. And so I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions this morning as we look at the scriptures. We're going to look at lots and lots of verses this morning. But I want you to ask yourself two questions. First of all, are you a person who lives by hope? Are you a hopeful person? Do you live with expectation? Do you um, look forward to, in, in confidence to the future? Are you a person who lives by hope? And the second question is probably even more important. If you were to answer yes to that question, my second question is this. What is your hope based on? Because that's the one thing that Webster leaves out of his definition. What is hope based on? Because if your hope isn't based on something, then it's not really hope at all. It's just wishful thinking. So what is your hope based on? The Bible teaches us throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament, but a lot, mainly in the Old Testament, a lot of things that we are tempted to, to put our hope in that we should not put our hopes in. So let's look at a few of these. I'm just going to read the references and you can write them down if you'd like and go and read them on your own time um, so that I don't spend too much time um, getting, I want to I spend more time on the do's than the don'ts this morning. But in Isaiah chapter 31 verses 1 through 3, the scripture teaches us that we should not put our hope in military might. Now to me that means, you know, not putting our hopes in the fact that we're Americans. Even though that's a wonderful thing and that is certainly, I believe, a blessing from God. But we don't put our hope 
in military might or where we live or what part of the world we live in. That is not where our hope should come from. In Proverbs 26, verse 12, we're taught not to put our hope in our own wisdom. And that's something that a lot of people do today. We think, well, you know, all the experiences that I've had and all the things that I've been through in life, you know, I kind of know how things are going to go and I put my hope in my own wisdom. Scripture teaches us not to do that. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 13 tells us not to put our hope in our own righteousness. Now that is something that is rampant in our world today. We all think that we're good enough. We're good people. We give, we go to church, we do nice things for people, we, we speak kindly to others. You know, in general, I, I think that a lot of people in our culture today, that we, we look at other people and we assume that everybody is inherently good. Is that true? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that is not true. None of us in and of ourselves are good. Yet there's many people, there are many people who sit in our churches who place their hope in their own righteousness. Scripture teaches us not to do that. Proverbs eleven twenty eight 28 and many, many other places in the Bible. We're taught not to put our hope in riches and wealth. We think if we can accumulate enough things and we can accumulate so much that we can give away a whole lot, then that makes us, that, that puts us in two categories. We're wealthy and we're righteous. And the scripture says, don't put your hope in riches because you're not going to be able to take it with you. And then in the New Testament, in John chapter 5, verse 45, and throughout the New Testament, Paul writes a lot about this as well, that we are not to put our hope in the law. We're not to put our hope in religion. We say, I go to church, I pray, I read the Bible, I do all the things that's supposed to make, that are supposed to make God happy. And I put my hope in those things. Don't put your hope in your religion. I rewrote Webster's definition a little bit to try to align with what I feel like the, the Scripture teaches. Now, I'm not, I'm not all that great of a writer, and you can probably come up with a better definition than this. But this is the definition that I feel like is, is at least more biblical. If it's, it, 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 it certainly improves on Webster's definition. And I wrote it this way. Hope is to live with great expectation, with confidence and courage in the promises of Almighty God. That is hope. That is the only foundation, that is the only basis where genuine hope can be found, is in the promises or in the person of God Himself, which we know has been revealed through His Son, Jesus Christ. Christmas should bring us hope that we not only have a living God, but we have a living God who makes promises, and we have a living God who keeps his promises. And the fact that Jesus was coming as a child, that he was going to live a sinless life, sinless, think about that. He never thought anything wrong. He never did anything wrong. He never said anything wrong. Everything he did, said, and thought was pleasing to God the Father. He lived a sinless life. He died your and my death so that we could be set free from our sins, and he rose three days later to conquer sin and death for all of eternity. Now, he made that promise, and we have seen that promise fulfilled in history. But that's not the only promise that he made. That's not the promise that we base our hope on today. It just gives us hope for the greater promise, for the future promise that he has made, which is what? That Jesus will come again. And that should give us great hope. That should give us confidence. That should give us courage to live boldly for Jesus Christ. To realize that we have a mission every day of our lives. Look at what the scripture says. Psalm 45 verses 5 and 6 teach us where our hope should come from. Psalmist says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Jeremiah says in chapter 14, verse 8, he says, O oh, you hope of Israel, he calls God the hope of Israel or the hope of God's people. O oh, you hope of Israel, its Savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? 
Is God your hope? Psalm 65 verse 5 says, by awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. What does it mean to hope? April, um, y'all know that I'm good at letting my wife read books to me. That's really about the only way I accomplish finishing a book. And she is reading this book right now called The Insanity of God by Nick Ripkin. I don't think that is, that's not actually his name, is it? Um, He was, either was or still is, a missionary to a very dangerous part of the world. And so he can't reveal his true identity and he can't really say exactly where he was doing ministry or where he's been doing missions because of, of all the... The, the persecution that is coming to the Christians in those areas. About half of this book, I believe, is him sharing stories from his experiences on the mission field and all of the, the difficulties and the persecutions that he himself witnessed and how people would be arrested if they even had a Bible in their home. They would be tortured, they would be killed, not just them, but their, their family members, their children, would be, their lives would be threatened. All of this book, every story in this book, has taken place and continues to take place in our lifetime on this planet today. And I want to read a few excerpts from this book because God has been challenging me and he's been wrecking my heart. April has been taking a really long time to read through this book because I'm just convinced you can't read a lot at one time. It's, It's just very difficult to swallow. But the Lord has been teaching me what hope is through the stories of these believers who have been through much, much persecution. The second half of this book is basically, as I see it, he's interviewing a lot of believers, maybe from Russia or former Soviet Union, where they came to faith under the communist rule and they had to, they had to hide their faith. They were threatened, just like many of the people um, in, in places where he did missions. And so he's interviewed countless believers who have, under, uh, who have e- experienced persecution that you and I just can't really imagine. And he's constantly asking them, why aren't you writing these st- stories down? People need to know about this. People need to know what's going on in the world. Other Christians need to know this. And at one point he's talking to an elderly believer from the former Soviet Union. And he's asking him, you know, what? You've you got to let me write these things down. We've got to put these things in a book. Why aren't you telling these stories to more people? And this gentleman says to Nick, he says, I understand that you have some sons, Nick. Is that true? I told him that it was true, and he nodded and then asked me, Tell me, Nick, how many times have you awakened your sons before dawn and brought them to a window like this one, one that faces east, and said to them, Boys, watch carefully. This morning you're going to see the sun come up in the east. It's going to happen in just a few more minutes. Get ready now, boys. How many times have you done that with your sons? Well, I chuckled. I've never done that. If I ever did that, my boys would think I was crazy. The sun always comes up in the east. It happens every morning. The old man nodded and smiled, and I didn't understand his point. I didn't understand his point, that is, until he continued. Nick, that's why we haven't made books and movies out of these stories that you've been hearing. For us, persecution is like the sun coming up in the east. It happens all the time. It's the way things are. There's nothing unusual or unexpected about it. Persecution for our faith has always been and probably always be a normal part of life. When I've been thinking about hope over these past few weeks, I wonder how many of us really have hope in Jesus Christ. How many of us live the kind of hope that would cause someone else to notice? Whereas these people who have gone through terrible, terrible persecution are bold about their faith. They are filled with joy and excitement and passion. They they get creative in how they share the gospel with other people. 
These folks in, in the Soviet Union, they gathered a group of about 700 young people from the ages of 18 to 30. They gathered them together because most of these people, they, did, they weren't allowed to have Bibles in their homes or they would be arrested. They could not have a copy of the Bible in their homes. And so many of these folks, they met just with their families. They didn't meet other Christians that they weren't related to. So these three pastors got together and said, let's, let's get as many young believers as we can together so that they can meet each other and interact. And maybe some of them will marry and will, will help carry on the faith. And so they gathered these 700 young believers together in the Soviet Union. The government found out what was going on. And after about a week, they shut the thing down and arrested the three pastors that had put it together. But before that happened, these pastors got these 700 young people and broke them up into groups, into small groups. And they said, we want to know how much of the Bible these, these young believers really know. And so they broke them up into groups and they encouraged them to write down as much of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as they could remember, as they had been taught in their homes. They also weren't allowed to have hymn books or song books. So they wanted to find out how many spiritual songs do these young people know. And in one week, in one week, these 700 young people from ages 18 to 30 wrote down word for word all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with less than six errors. They also wrote 12 hundred spiritual songs in a week. Now you tell me that there weren't people in their lives who were living with a hope that goes beyond what we see in our day and time over here in America, in, the, in our churches today. Those people have a hope that is, that is so difficult to understand. I don't know about you, but that steps all over my toes because I wouldn't be able to do that. And I've been studying God's word my entire life. Another thing that God has been stepping on my toes with is as April reads this book, I'm being moved and God's challenging me and God's growing me and God's pushing me in directions that I'm not even sure I fully understand. That's why I'm sharing it with you. I don't want to carry the burden by myself so you can carry it with me. But I keep telling April as she shares these stories, I'm like, you know, it sounds like you're reading the Bible just with other people's names and with different circumstances because it sounds like Paul and Silas being thrown into prison. It sounds like Paul and Barnabas, you know, being run out of town. It sounds like Timothy and, 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 and you know, just, just dealing with false teachers and being accused and, and, not, and not followed. And, and it, just, it just sounds like the Bible over and over and over again. Nick met with another group of, of men, I guess men and women, um, from the former Soviet Union. And again, was asking them the same, the same question about why these stories aren't known by more people. And Nick says this, he says, I just don't understand why you haven't collected these stories in a book. Believers around the world ought to hear what you've been telling me here today. Your stories are amazing. These are, they, these are inspiring testimonies. I've, I've never heard anything like them. An older pastor reached out and took my shoulder. He clamped his other hand tightly onto my arm and looked me right in the eye. He said, son, when did you stop reading your Bible? All of our stories are in the Bible. God has already written them down. Why would we bother writing books to tell our stories when God has already told his story? If you would just read the Bible, you would see that our stories are there. He paused, and then he asked me again, When did you stop reading your Bible? Without waiting for me to answer, he turned and walked away. There was no friendly smile, no encouraging pat on the back, and no kiss on the cheek. His convicting question still echoes in my mind. Have we gotten to a point in our culture today in the church today, where we read the book. We have the book in our homes. How many of you have more than one copy of this book in your home? 
Is it possible that we've gotten to a point that we read this book and we think it's all about the past? And we don't realize that it is living and active, that it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, as we've talked about in 2 Timothy. That this book is about you and about me, and it should inspire hope. It should inspire the kind of living that causes other people to notice that there is something different about you and me. Have we gotten so comfortable that we've really lost our hope? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 18. You you should turn there and follow along with me. I love this passage of Scripture, and it really illustrates the point today of how the prophecies of Jesus give us hope, how there is hope in the Christmas story, in the Christmas account, that God gave us these prophecies for a reason, and that our hope is to be placed in God and God alone. And if you place your hope anywhere else, your hope is doomed. The writer of Hebrews says this, starting in chapter 6, verse 13. He says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by whom? Himself. Saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we, have fled, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Let me ask you, what hope are you living for? What hope is before you? I, I think of hope kind of like as kind of like the carrot that you're going after. What is it that you're living for? Because just like I said last week, other people will notice. Other people will figure out whether they can put the terms to it or not. Other people will notice what or whom you are living for. And if other people were to look at your life, would they accuse you? Of living with hope. Peter raises a a challenging question for us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Anytime I've taught on that passage of scripture, I've talked about, I've taught on how to share your faith. But I want you to think of a different question this morning as we read that verse. Does anybody have a reason to ask you about the hope that you have? Are you living in such a way that would cause anyone to even think that you hoped in something beyond yourself? The most haunting thing so far that April's read in this book is a a quote that I, I don't think and I hope I never get over. And I'm going to share it with you, and I hope it wrecks your heart as it has wrecked mine. I hope it stomps on your toes as hard as it's stomping on mine. And I hope you never forget this. Nick was interviewing a a man named Stoyan. And Stoyan shared with him, Stoyan had been through much persecution. His family had been persecuted. His mother had been um, approached by one of the authorities when he was a boy. And he, and, and he had said, look, I can kill you, I can kill your husband, and I can kill your son, and I will, be, I will be celebrated for it. And his mother looked at looked at this man who could take her life right then. And she said, yes, sir, you could take my life. You could take my husband's life. And yes, you could even choose to take my son's life. But you could never take away the love of my Savior. And he said in that moment, he was so proud of his mother. But here he is as an old man. And he says this to Nick. He says, I thank God and I take great joy in knowing that I was suffering in prison in my country so that you, Nick, could be free to share Jesus in Kentucky.
those words pierced my soul. Have you ever thought about those in other countries who are enduring intense persecution and that their hope and their prayer is for you and me who had the freedom to share the gospel every day of our lives without any real fear and that they're praying that their persecution counts for something. He says, those words pierced my soul. I looked Stoyan straight in the eyes and said, oh no, I protested, no, you are not going to do that. You're not going to put that on me. That is a debt so large that I can never repay you. Stoyan stared right back at me and said, son, I think it's funny that they all call him son. Son, that's the debt of the cross. He leaned forward and poked me in the chest with his finger and continued, don't you steal my joy. I took great joy that I was suffering in my country so that you could be free to witness in your country. Then he raised his voice in a prophet-like challenge that I knew would live with me forever. And folks, if you don't hear anything else I say this morning, hear this. Don't ever give up in freedom what we would never have given up in persecution. Hmm. Don't ever give up in freedom what we would never have given up in persecution. That is our witness to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, where is your hope? We have a living, almighty, powerful, loving, promise-making and promise-keeping God. And he has placed us in a land where we can share the gospel freely and openly without fear. The worst fear you may ever face is that someone might not want to be your friend anymore. And yet we find ways to complain about how comfortable it is in our sanctuaries. We get on social media and we fret about, oh my goodness, I picked the wrong paint color for my bathroom. Now it's going to take a week longer to get it painted. Does anyone in your life who doesn't know Jesus have any reason to ever ask you the reason for the hope that you have? Christmas should bring us great hope. That God made a promise. He made promises centuries before they ever took place. And he fulfilled them. And we can have the confidence in knowing that when he says he is returning, that he is. And that we have a mission to fulfill. And I hope and pray that you will fulfill that mission every day of your life with every person that God places in your path. Let us live with a hope that shines for everyone else to see. And I pray that other people will ask you, I hope that they will ask you this week to give an account for the reason of the hope that they see in you. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me for how often I let the little things in life that don't matter Rob me of my hope in you. Forgive me for how often I live as though I am hopeless. Father, today, help us to see that we have so much opportunity, so much privilege. Help us to believe that you are a promise-keeping God and that we can count on you, that we can depend on you, that we can lean on you in those times that maybe are threatening, that maybe we're not sure of what to say or how to say it. Lord, that you would give us the courage and the confidence to step out in faith and to demonstrate that our hope is not in the military might of this country, that our hope is not in our own wisdom, that we understand that one day our wisdom is going, to, is going to be nothing compared to yours. Lord, that we would realize that our hope cannot be in our own righteousness because we know that our best works are but filthy rags before you. Lord, help us to not place our hope in things like riches because we're not going to take them with us. And one day we are going to face the reality that from dust we came and to dust we will return. And the only thing that's going to matter is Jesus Christ. 
Oh God, that we would live, that we would live in a way that other people would ask why we have the hope that we have. Lord, help us not to give up in freedom what so many of our brothers and sisters would have never given up in persecution. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for the hope that you give that goes beyond our circumstances. May we live in it every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a time where we respond to God's word, however it is that God's leading you to respond. I don't know if that means that you need to come forward. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and today is the day that you need to say yes to him and surrender your all to him today. If that's the case, I'll be down front. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to help you understand. If you have questions about what it means to be a Christian, I'd love to talk to you about that. If you're not a member of a local church and you need a church home, we would love if you would join our family and serve with us here. And if you have questions about that, I'll be down front and I can answer some. If you know, try to do my best to answer those questions for you as well. If you need to walk across the aisle, I say this every week, and you need to get a relationship right in this sanctuary, I hope and pray that you will do that today. Whatever it is that you need to do, I pray that you will respond to the gospel as the Lord leads. We're going to stand and sing. I'll be down front if I can serve you in any way.